All right, so our next invited speaker uh, is Saror Hedier-Zadeh, and she will be talking on uh, mass spectrometry. So a bit of a change of topic. Uh, Saror is also uh, at, at the WeHi uh, here in Melbourne, and I'll pass it over to you now, Saror. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present and everyone who tuned, who tuned in today. Uh, yes, uh, it's gonna be a change in, uh, in, the, in the topic, uh, and I'm probably gonna be uh, presenting what is going to be a crash course on master spec and then introduce MSMP and then latest developments and results that we have for, um, uh, for the package. So uh, there is uh, there's a great interest currently in uh, master spectrometry as it is the only technology that enables us to quantify uh, proteins uh, that exist in uh, complex uh, biological samples exhaustively and comprehensively. And uh, that's important because proteins are involved in regulation of biological processes. They, are, um, they uh, modulate signaling pathways. They are targets of drugs and we know that uh, there isn't quite a correlation or necessary cor necessarily a correlation between protein and RNA. So it's important to measure proteins directly and quantify them. Uh, the readouts from mass spectrometer are unfortunately though very complicated. Um, and um, there's a, we can't, uh, due to the reasons that I'll ex explain later, we can't really quantify uh, all the proteins consistently across samples, across all samples that we have in our experiment. And this becomes problematic as it uh, raises the, the issue with um, missing values. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, kind of recap what's involved in mass spectrometry as a, a very quick uh, and very simple overview. The proteins in your samples are digested into peptides that are kind of ionized, they are passed through uh, liquid chromatography uh, where um, uh, these ionized peptides are separated by retention time. So each uh, signal that you see over here is a, uh, is a peptide. And then that signal is um, uh, kind of sequenced um, in, um, a, um, in a process called MSMS or tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, where it produces a spectra similar to this. That spectra uh, is compared against a database of the reticle spectra. Uh, and then based on that, you can determine the identity of your peptide. Um, something that's um, uh, important in this uh, procedure or in this framework, which is known as LCMSMS, is that um, among all the signals that you actually capture in your liquid chromatography, only top and most intense of them are selected for fragmentation or sequencing. So you lose information about uh, from uh, everything else. Um, so this procedure or this uh, kind of data acquisition workflow is known as top and data dependent acquisition. And so recently, another dimensionality has been added uh, where um, in addition to separation by retention time or elution time, the molecule, the ionized molecules are also separated based on their shape um, and um, or, or trapped ion mobility. So this um, new, this whole new workflow is now known as uh, liquid chromatography trapped ion mobility followed by mass spectrometry. Um, uh, and, uh, but the issue that we have is that again, with this acquisition workflow, although we have better separation between peptides, um, we, we are still practically only sequencing top and most um, intense signals. Uh, and the rest of the identification procedure kind of uh, is the same. Um, so we obtain uh, an aspect graph from uh, our sequencing step, which is our passive step, and then uh, compare it to a reference mass database of X spectra, and then we can um, you know, get um, information about what's the identity of the peptide, what's the sequence of the peptide, what's its retention time, and um, ion mobility values, and et cetera. Um, so there has been indeed um, previously reported that, you know, um, um, from, uh, you know, there are more than 100,000 of detectable peptide species that elute in a single sample or a single mass spectrometry run. However, the majority of them are not really sequenced. So in this case, in this dynamic image, in this GIF image, you are seeing peptides eluting in a given time frame and in a, in a given MZ range. Um, the text that appears next to the signals um, is the sequence of the peptide. And so everything with um, every signal with um, the text next to it, it means that it's identified. So the sequence is known or, um, or it's sequenced. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of them uh, with no signals, with no text next to it, which has, means that it's kind of missed by sequencing. So you see that there are uh, lots of signals that are missed by C. They are not sequenced at all, uh, but they actually exist. And um, um, you know, it's possible that you can detect them, but uh, the sequencing technology is still uh, lacking behind and it's not quite capable of um, detecting every single peptide species that's there. And so this plot over here, what's it's, uh, essentially repeating the same thing that in your uh, LC MSMS uh, workflow, you are missing, uh, you're detecting, potentially detecting lots of peptide features or peptide signals, but only um, uh, this green proportion of them are actually sequenced. With the trap ion mobility technology, you uh, would hope you you are you know you are hoping that you increase the depth of sequencing, but in practice we are still we are still not really quite there. So uh, the stochastic nature of this top end selection procedure means that we can't really quantify proteins and peptides consistently across samples, particularly in large cohorts. So it uh, limits our ability to quantify lower abundance ions, and uh, just because we can't really quantify all our features, uh, i.e. peptides or protein consistently across samples or commonly across samples, we have lots of missing values. There have been alternative uh, data acquisition workflows um, that address limitations of data dependent acquisition. But in practice, the broader dynamic range, the dynamic range in DDA is much larger. And so it's more appropriate for discovery based proteomics. One of the crucial steps that happen at the quantification is identification, transfer, or match between run. And this is where um, a peptide that's uh, detected in a donor run, um, in a, it's detected in a run, it's transferred to a run where it's missing, but a peak or a signal exists within the neighborhood, within a reasonable neighborhood of this uh, donor peptide over here. But what I would like to take from this, and well, of course, this is done, this identification transfer idea is done to increase the number of peptides that we can detect uh, commonly across runs. But uh, what I would like you to take from this slide is that if there is a misassignment going on here, uh, this gives a rise to uh, another type of missing values, which we call it missing at random. So just as a quick recap, I, uh, I explained how a stochastic intensity-based sampling of peptide ions for fragmentation results in missing that is not at random, it's in intensity dependent, whereas peak matching at the match between runner step is likely to result in a missing at random pattern. There are also experimental factors that contribute to um, missingness, and that can be ion suppression, for example, which is the case where the signal for a peptide is suppressed in the presence of other peptides eluting at the same time in the run. There are also other experimental um, factors that I'm not really going to cover them today. So in what is now version two of MS Impute, we are um, in version one, we had a model that would impute missing values uh, using low rank approximation, which I'll explain, uh, but the assumption of that method was largely uh, based on the fact that, you know, you were, you were assuming that um, peptides are missing at random. So in version two, we kind of extended the imputation or enhanced imputation by taking a three-step approach. We would, um, and I will go through each of these steps um, in, later, um, later in, a, in, in later slides. So we would, in version two, we now um, estimate the distribution of peptide on their MAR assumption. Uh, we would also estimate it on their missing not at random assumption. Um, and uh, then we would kind of um, take the weighted average uh, between these two distribution, depending on the evidence that we get from the data, that whether the peptide is missing at random or missing not at random. And we called it the value center approach. But now let's see what's involved in this uh, individual step. So the idea from doing a three-step uh, kind of estimation of um, peptide intensity was that each peptide with some probability is missing at random and ideally with, you know, with one minus that probability is missing not at random. So it was important to consider each uh, kind of probability or each possible outcome for a peptide. So if uh, um, for doing imputation on their missing at random assumptions, uh, we are using uh, 
we are essentially estimating two lower rank or lower dimensional matrices. So the dimensions of these matrices are going to be uh, some value R, which is less than the total number of samples uh, and peptides that you initially have in your incomplete matrix. So the low rank approximation means that we are really after, we are trying to estimate two matrices A and B here in purple and orange. Um, through this minimization, um, through this kind of objective, through this e equation or objective function. Um, so in this, um, yes, this minimization is done only with respect to the observed values. And this is what this uh, omega parameter over here, it's a projection function. It means that I'm gonna do this minimization iteratively um, only over observed values until I get to reasonable estimates of A and B according to this minimization procedure. And this lambda over here is really the parameter that controls uh, the R estimation, you know, or the rank of the matrix or the dimensionality of the two A and B matrices. Um, low rank approximation is a kind of a global imputation strategy. So what happens is that if, you, if the majority of the peptides tend to have high expression, in uh, samples, you know, you would you would impute the rest of the samples uh, with the high values as well. So your distribution would kind of theoretically would look like shifted towards higher values as uh, shown here. What we realized was that um, letting lambda to estimate R wasn't really working in um, typical uh, proteomics conditions where we have only six or uh, you know eight samples. So we kind of have our rank estimation procedure in version two is now using effective rank, which is using a entropic based approach to uh, compute where the rank, where, where the information in data sits in, on what dimension, what would be the appropriate dimensionality. Uh, but this effective rank we um, um, recommended when you have two, 20 or more uh, runs. If you have less than that, um, the different several benchmarkings have kind of uh, demonstrated to us that it's better to go with rank two models, which is kind of uh, equivalent to imputation by mean, but not um, that um, it's not really that I mean, that much equivalent. But um, and I'll show you where those kind of guidelines come from in my benchmark results. So for uh, estimation under missing not at random assumption, we are just following the typical downshift approach, the commonly used downshift approach. So with the downshift approach, every um, missing value is replaced with the value uh, with the lowest observed with, uh, by, by random draws from a Gaussian distribution parameterized around the lowest observed value. So you would typically observe, replace them with very low values. Um, and therefore, the expected distribution uh, seems to be, you know, the mass of the distribution seems to me to uh, around uh, lowest values. So the idea with the Barry Center approach is that, you know, as I mentioned, each peptide has with some probabilities missing at random, missing not at random. Let's use an, a data driven um, metric to see which of these two distributions is likely, and and just simply lets the uh, let's um, do a weighted average of this distribution based on the evidence. So the evidence that we are using to uh, to on um, to find out whether the peptide is missing at random or not at random is again uh, entropy based approach. Uh, so the preprint that was up on the Slack channel was out of date, but we are working on a preprint it should be out hopefully soon, um, and you can follow up the details of that. Um, uh, in, in the manuscript, but um, the general idea is that we use that entropy-based evidence to understand whether the peptide is likely to be missing at random or missing not at random, uh, and then weight these two distributions according to that evidence. And uh, we call this like the Barry Center because Barry Centers are known uh, are essentially weighted averages of distributions. So looking at uh, some benchmarking results. We have looked at um, um, controlled, uh, we have taken six uh, published controlled mixture or UPS1 spiking data sets. So these are data sets where proteins are spiked at known concentrations, and we know that only those specific proteins should be differentially abundant. Um, so um, and what we are looking, what we are looking at are essentially just ROC curves. Um, 
And so the larger the area under the curve, the better. And you see that in most uh, cases, um, uh, the body center approach is the, um, the most outer curve. So it's, uh, it's giving you uh, a large number of true positives, but also maintaining a good uh, false positive rate. And we compared it against what is known as um, uh, state-of-the-art imputation methods. So we were happy to see that. Um, Another equally important aspect of benchmarking uh, imputation methods is, look at, is to look at distribution of p-values under null hypothesis. So the idea is that you know, if, I, uh, if I have a bunch of technical replicates and I randomly uh, split them into two groups and I do a differential expression, do I see a, a p-value p less than 0.05, which means that there's a signal. You know, Because you are looking at technical replicates, you do not expect to see a signal. Uh, but if you, um, so any departures from uniformity uh, tells you, you know, how bad the method is doing. And comparing, again, the Barry Center approach with the rest of the um, state-of-the-art imputation methods, uh, we found that the Barry Center approach is actually maintaining a better uniform distribution on their null hypothesis compared to uh, the other uh, approaches. So, um, we keep working uh, on uh, imputation um, procedures that we can add to SMS impute. And one of the ideas was, let's instead of instead of um, imputation, let's uh, let's infer missing values. Um, and uh, I think that the solution that uh, we came up with and was um, included in the latest release was um, uh, kind of built on. Um, the idea, you know, revisiting the transfer identification step, but not really at the quantification level, right at the level of mass spectrometry runs or raw data, but rather um, building on top of the actual max quant output. Uh, so what we are doing here is that we are actually taking max quant outputs, so not even the raw data, but rather max quant outputs, and we are essentially revisiting the max quant results uh, to see if it's possible to improve identification transfer between runs. That is to transfer a peptide sequence from a run that is detected to other runs where it's missing. So I'm not going to be able to go through the details of what is known as MSP, um, but um, when we um, applied MSP um, or this identification transfer, we realized that while well, comparing to Barry Center, Barry Center is still seems to be outperforming um, this uh, peptide identification um, um, transfer or MSP. But um, we saw that you know in some instances there was good. Um, so still we are looking at the outer the curve, the better. And MSP um, is, um, you know, it appears in different colors, but we found that it had uh, comparable results to the state-of-the-art imputation methods. Uh, in terms of, you know, so when you do identification transfer, um, it's important that, you know, you make sure that the estimate of the log fold change is accurate. You are not artificially in, um, you're not, um, mis uh, you're not estimating the log fault change estimate in an incorrect way. Um, so we looked at uh, a uh, kind of mixture, protein mixture of uh, three uh, species, homo sapiens, S, yeast, and E. coli. So the protein from these three species were spiked at known concentrations. So we know their relative ratios. We know the proteins from uh, yeast, for example, should be downregulated um, at full change of um, you know, minus one compared to human and E. coli. And so we looked at you know, how um, the peptide identification or MSP um, would um, incorrectly estimate the log fault changes. And we, we found that, you know, unless, well, if you, um, so with the MSP uh, strategy, you can only retain the most confident um, pep, uh, identification transfers, or you can you know, keep all the identification transfers that MSP finds out there. Uh, but what we saw that you know, when we were uh, filtering the low confidence one, we were still getting a reasonable estimate of log for changes. But when we kept all the identification transfers, we start to, so the performance start to drop. And uh, we saw that some of these, uh, some of the proteins um, in E. coli, for example, that we knew they had to be upregulated, the log fault change was estimated instead as if it was downregulated. 
So in terms of looking at also false positive, um, sorry, false transfer rates, um, we looked at a data set where we essentially do identification transfer between a bunch of runs that only contain human proteins and a bunch of runs that contain human and uh, E. coli or yeast proteins. And so the idea is that, you know, in your human runs, you should only see human proteins after identification transfer. Um, so the fact that you are analyzing um, the two sets of experiments together, it should not, if the uh, algorithm was uh, performing very well, you shouldn't really, uh, you shouldn't see that yeast peptides transfer to uh, human runs. And, you know, you can use that as a proxy to see um, to what extent the algorithm is making um, mistakes or uh, is uh, detecting, is, detect, is uh, causing false transfers between runs. Uh, and so we found that the uh, usual peptide identification transfer, so MSP could indeed uh, be associated with a false transfer rate of up to 75%, but um, you know, the data set that we have wasn't really uh, ideal. I mean, there are only a few instances when you would have a mix of uh, different species in your in your runs. Um, but we show that you know if you restrict identification transfer only within the human runs, you could maintain um, a false transfer rate that was even lower than max quant match between run algorithm but you could uh, peak more, you could detect more, or you could quantify more um, peptides. Uh, so just to um, kind of summarize, so in version two, um, we, are, uh, we are using effective rank for estimation of, um, uh, to, to do our rank estimation. And we are hoping that, um, and we see that in different, benchmarking a strategy is that this uh, kind of improves um, instead of using the defaults, I mean, instead of letting that objective function or that minimization procedure to determine the rank of the two matrices, two lower rank matrices. So we have incorporated ways to do imputation um, to account for missingness that is not at random. The barrier center, it's a interpolation strategy is different from mixed imputation that some of the uh, users um, in the audience um, could have been practicing so far because you are weighting each distribution according to some evidence from the data. Um, the evidence is entropic. It's, pro it's not necessary. It's not a probabilistic model, but it doesn't undermine its validity. It's just a different way of modeling missing at random, missing not at random. Um, and uh, it's designed to work with, uh, SMP is designed to work with uh, normalized data, log transform intensities. There are also, we have also added a couple of uh, diagnostic plots or other handy tools that kind of makes, uh, makes it more convenient for you to um, work directly with max quant, read max quant outputs directly and um, um, work work with Lima in a more straightforward way. Um, so of course, the latest developments will first appear on, um, on the GitHub repository. So feel free to check out the GitHub repository. Um, and I just wanted to do a, since this is a bioconductor uh, talk, um, uh, I just wanted to kind of do a quick um, workflow demonstration that you know all you need to do for the imputation part is essentially your, um, matrix, your incomplete matrix, and, um, you know, choosing a method. Um, so our version two, we have, this, we have provided some kind of guide, guidelines uh, with respect to, you know, which of these options um, you would, um, you should choose or you should consider to choose in, uh, on our GitHub repository on the README page. Um, there, there will be vignettes and there will be um, more documents. Um, soon, but the idea is that, you know, um, the idea is that you would have some assumptions whether your data is going to have missing at randomness or it's going to be missing not at random. So if you know that missing at randomness is um, mostly associated with, you know, there are things that you would expect to see in DIA approach, in DIA data, missing not at random is kind of inherent to DDA. So you would choose your method depending on the data acquisition workflow. 
And this is the kind of the workflow that kind of demonstrates how you can load uh, MaxCon output results um, and uh, you know, integrate them very easily with Lima, with a standard Lima differential expression framework. Um, but of course, I mean, as you appreciate, the MSP is still in progress. Um, I mean, it's, we are still doing benchmarking and uh, improving up and the implementation MSP. Um, that's it from me. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisors, Melissa and Andrew, uh, Daryl and uh, Rune for being very helpful during my, in help, helping me getting started in my PhD. Uh, Jumana and Samantha, I mean, uh, I received feedback from um, essentially data analysts who worked um, in, at the uh, proteomics division. Uh, and then I improve up in MSMP, which is very valuable and I appreciate it. Thank you and um, happy to take your questions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, reminder that people can ask questions on the Slack channel for Sarah's talk and uh, they can be answered over the coming days. I thought um, I'd ask one. Uh, so imputation and, and the notion of uh, missing at random and missing at not at random, they're pretty familiar concepts to statisticians, but how do you go uh, convincing uh, your biological colleagues of these concepts and are they comfortable with things like imputation? I'll, my experience as a statistician is that sometimes biologists are uh, quite suspicious of imputation and think you're just kind of making up data. And is that how do you approach those sorts of conversations? That's right. And indeed, that's indeed what's the case. So I know that they typically uh, do the analysis with imputation and without imputation, and they repeat. Um, I mean, they compare the results. Um, the notion of missing not at random is uh, very, I, I think there are two, uh, you can divide missing not at random in proteomics into two parts. There's an intensity dependent missing not at random. And um, there's also this um, group specific. Um, so, so the fact that, you know, as the uh, abundance uh, of the peptide ion species becomes less, the detection and quantification becomes more difficult. And so you get more missing values. But even for the higher abundance peptides, we see that they often exhibit condition specific or group specific missing values. So they are missing in one specific experimental condition and the other one. So I said that because you know, the statistical procedures that we use for missing not at random treatment are not quite directly trans, you know, these, we can't really directly translate them or employ them in proteomics. There are still uh, variations and differences. But yes, um, that's true. They are often suspicious about doing imputation. Um, and unfortunately, during the pre-processing, like filtering step, uh, uh, more importantly, they even introduce biases in the data that makes the whole uh, reproducibility of the analysis even more challenging. So um, there are many aspects in proteomics that are not uh, well defined. There are not really yet workflows out there to help users um, to you know, follow those workflows and um, the lack of um, existence of these kind of uh, uniform workflows um, means that you know they'll try different things. They introduce biases in different variation in different um, um, at different stages of pre-processing, and so it, you, you know there are uncertain about imputation, but also the uncertainty has added during the data analysis step. Um, so one of the ideas that MSP was trying to address was incorporation of how how in inconfident I am about the imputation method. So with MSP, you get a weight uh, for each imputed values. Um, and so you can essentially downweight them or using Lima um, kind of Lima room estimation procedure to downweight the imputed value. So, and this is why we are really looking into getting MS Impute to work or other versions of equivalent of it. Um, but I think that would really, um, the MS, the idea of downweighting imputed values, uh, similar to what we are hoping to pursue with MSP would help uh, biologists to um, become more confident in terms of the analysis that they do. Thank you very much. So we're right on five o'clock. So thank you, Saror. Uh, <laughs>